Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Probe Compensation. In this short presentation, we're going to discuss what probe compensation is and why it's important. Let's start by considering the measurement of a 50 volt DC source. In this basic arrangement, our scope, which was designed to have an input resistance of 1 mega ohm, sees the full 50 volts. If we wanted to reduce this measured voltage by a factor of 10, we could do this by using a 9 mega ohm resistor to create a simple voltage divider. Now the scope input sees only 5 volts. In a standard 10x passive probe, this 9 mega ohm resistor is moved into the probe tip. But there are a couple of things complicating our simple 10x passive probe measurement. First, all scopes have a certain amount of inherent capacitance in parallel with their input resistance. Typically, this capacitance is in the low tens of picofarads. This wouldn't be a problem if we were only measuring DC, but it does become a problem once we start measuring AC. This is because as the frequency increases, the input capacitance starts acting as a low pass filter. We can counteract this effect by placing a capacitor in the probe tip, such that the ratio of CT to CN is inversely proportional to the ratio of the 9 and 1 mega ohm resistors. There's one last little problem. What value should we use for CT? Well, this depends on the value of CN, and this value varies from scope to scope. The simple solution would be to make the probe tip capacitor, CT, a variable capacitor, but this usually isn't practical. So what we do instead is we add an additional variable capacitor, called CP, to the probe, often locating it in a so-called compensation box where it's easy to adjust using a simple tool. By adding this adjustable variable capacitor, we can compensate our probe to obtain a relatively flat frequency response. And this is how most 10x passive probes are constructed. Let's look at an actual 10x passive probe. We can see the probe tip, containing the 9 mega ohm resistor and fixed capacitance, and the compensation box, containing the variable capacitance. In most cases, this variable capacitance is located near the scope attachment point, but it could be located elsewhere within the probe. As the name implies, probe compensation is the process whereby we adjust the probe capacitance to compensate for the effects of the inherent input capacitance of the scope. As we'll see in a moment, properly compensating the probes is necessary if we want the best possible accuracy, or linearity, in our measurement results. Remember that we compensate our probe to have a more linear frequency response. A poorly compensated probe causes two main types of measurement inaccuracies. The first is incorrect amplitudes. For example, if we compare a measurement made with a properly compensated probe, to measurements made with an under or overcompensated probe, we find significant amplitude variation even at low frequencies. The second consequence of incorrect probe compensation is distorted waveforms, more specifically, changes in the rise and fall times of pulse signals. It's important to remember that these inaccuracies increase with increasing frequency. Probes should therefore be compensated before first use or before making any important measurements. Since different scopes have different input capacitances, we need to compensate our probe whenever we move it to a different scope. Moving between ports on the same scope is usually okay. And as we mentioned just a moment ago, probe compensation becomes more important as signal frequency increases, so be extra sure to compensate your probes if you're working at higher frequencies. So how exactly do we compensate a probe? Almost all scopes have a built-in square wave generator, usually running at a frequency of 1000 Hz. It may be labeled something like probe compensation and or be indicated by a square wave and ground symbol. We connect the tip of the probe to the square wave source and the probe ground lead to the ground. A non-conductive screwdriver or other tool is then used to adjust the capacitance until the square wave compensation signal appears as rectangular as possible. Let's see what this should look like. A probe is properly compensated when the tops of the compensation signal are essentially horizontal. Overcompensated probes create overshoot on the leading edge of the signal, and undercompensated probes cause undershoot on the leading edge. In the case of either over or undercompensated probes, we adjust the compensation capacitor until the waveform has nice square edges. This usually takes only a small fraction of a turn. Note that square or rectangular waves are used for probe compensation because they have both high frequency as well as low frequency components. 
Probe compensation is fairly straightforward. If you're having trouble compensating your probe, there are a couple of things to check. First, make sure that the probe compensation signal is properly displayed and stable. In most cases, your scope's auto set feature will do this for you. And make sure you've connected the probe ground lead as well as the probe tip to the compensation signal. Sometimes you can run into issues if you're using a probe that wasn't designed for your scope. There's a limited range over which a probe's capacitance can be adjusted, so depending on your scope's input capacitance, you might not be able to fully compensate a foreign probe. But in general, probe compensation is usually quick and painless, so don't forget to compensate your probes before making measurements. Let's summarize what we've learned. Probe compensation is a process whereby we adjust the ratio of capacitances in both the probe tip and the scope input. Uncompensated probes can lead to measurement inaccuracies with regards to things like amplitude and pulse shape. Therefore, probes should always be compensated when used with a particular scope for the first time and whenever we're making important measurements. The probe compensation procedure is very simple. We just connect the probe to the scope's built-in probe compensation signal and ground, then adjust the compensation capacitor until the signal is as rectangular as possible. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Probe Compensation. Thanks for watching.